in there. So now, cyber criminal group Gold Tahoe, they made the headlines earlier this year by extorting hundreds of victims after exploiting a zero-day vulnerability in a file transfer solution. Big, big subject. And I'm excited to learn the history of this group and how to mitigate their attacks. And the man to unpack this is here. So please do welcome Keith Jarvis, the cybercrime lead in SecureWorks Counter Threat Unit. You're here. Thank you so much, Keith, for joining us up on the stage. Really looking forward to this one, a very complex subject. Yes, thank you for having me. Well, uh, without further ado, we're going to track on because we've got tons of content to get through. So I'm going to give you the floor. And of course, there's your lovely audience ready for you as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> So uh, welcome again, my name is Keith Jarvis. I'm a senior security researcher with the CTU TR. Um, I spend most of my time doing malware analysis, threat intelligence analysis, with a focus on financial, financially motivated threat criminals, um, mostly that operate botnets, but one of the more prolific groups that we, we monitor uh, is this Gold Tahoe threat group that um, is responsible for, for CLOP. So, so who is Gold Tahoe, right? So this is a group that's been active since late 2014, but 2015 at least. Um, when we talk about Gold Tahoe, we're talking about a group that largely maps into the public reporting of Proofpoint's TA505, Microsoft's Lace Tempest, and Mandiant's Fin11. Uh, so most of the, the body of work that's out there from those organizations covers what we consider to be Gold Tahoe. And this is a group that since uh, um, up until 2019 uh, was running a, an operation where they were doing loads for other criminal threat groups. So they were providing services that would distribute malware on behalf of other cyber criminal threat groups. Uh, some of these would be as rather ins inconsequential, um, sort of low capability threat groups, but other groups would be uh, some of the more well-known threat groups, uh, Gold Drake, the Drydex group, slash Evil Corp. Um, Gold Blackburn, the group that distributed TrickBot. Uh, so a lot of really well-known and very highly capable threat groups. Um, and Gold Tahoe would work with all of them. Uh, so they, uh, they would really work with anybody. But then in 2019, they really uh, started to change over from just being a pure load service to um, also distributing their own ransomware, which was called CLOP. And this was a variant of CryptoMix, which was a ransomware kit that was made available to uh, certain threat actors on the underground. Uh, it was used in a number of attacks up until uh, it became CLOP, um, and they started to distribute that themselves, um, moving away from the load service being their main source of income and actually perpetrating ransomware attacks. Um, in those first early months and years, they, uh, like many other groups, negotiated those ransoms through emails that were left in the ransom note, but then eventually they, they caught on to the, the wagon of using a Tor leak site and client payment portal. So up here in, in, the, in the top of the slide, you can see um, a blue arrow, uh, and that's when really in 2014-15, a really cohesive picture of this threat group started to come together when we began to track them as an individual threat group. Um, right there, cut in the middle, is when they transitioned from being a, a pure load service, malware distribution service, into the group that we know today that's distributing the CLOP ransomware. And, and below that, we have what we, what we call ransomware ebooks. So these are um, the, the sort of discrete um, periods of time where ransomware evolved from one thing to another thing to the next thing, starting with screen lockers back in 2008 through about 2012. These were just uh, uh, things that literally locked your screen but didn't delete um, any of your, uh, your files, didn't encrypt your file system. Um, they just demanded a prepaid paid card um, and they would unlock your screen for that. So uh, then in 2013, CryptoLocker really changed the game. They, they decided that it would be in fact beneficial to them to actually encrypt files on the system um, and, and then charge an extortion fee for re returning those, those files safely to the, to the individual. Um, so that, that started off a, an era of consumer-based, um, consumer-targeted ransomware. And this was uh, really meant to go towards home users or even corporate users, but it would only affect a single endpoint. So you would receive um, the, the ransomware through an email or through a secondary infection of a botnet, and it would infect a single machine. But then in 2015, 2016, we really started to see a, a trend where these threat actors would uh, not be satiated by just uh, infecting a single machine, but they would get into a computer network 
uh, move laterally and infect as many possible endpoints as they could. And in the last several years, we've seen a, a growing trend of groups that forego ransomware entirely. So this is uh, the hack and leak era. Uh, Clop was kind of a, 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 an early innovator here. It's, it's a group that goes in and steals data, exfiltrates data, and uses that as the singular uh, leverage point for, for extortion. So they're not necessarily um, deploying ransomware, though they do keep it in their back pocket for use. So is CLOP a ransomware as a service? This comes up uh, every once in a while. I get asked about this. Uh, there's quite a few criteria that we use to determine if a ransomware conspiracy is a ransomware as a service, or is it just a single threat group using a bespoke piece of ransomware to perpetrate their own attacks, right? So one of the things that we look for is like a clear delegation of capabilities. So uh, um, is, the, is the threat group that's running the RAS building ransomware binaries, passing it on to affiliates? Are they negotiating the ransoms directly with victims? Are they running the PR, putting the, uh, the stolen data up on the Tor sites? Are they handling the payouts, uh, any bit mixing that happens after a payout goes to an affiliate, if they're handling those sorts of things? Um, they, also, uh, they also have a, a hierarchy. So uh, when, when a RAS service um, contracts with an affiliate, they're the boss. So they make the decisions about what happens, about what victims can be attacked, how much money they're going to extort from that victim, and so forth and so, so on. So it's very much a top-down hierarchy. Um, the payment split is pre-agreed by these teams. So the affiliates and the ransomware operator will say, uh, we're going to do an 80-20 split or 70-30, depending on uh, a number of factors. Um, and there's also usually some sort of affiliate portal. This may look like a, uh, like a web portal where they can go in and do ransomware builds and talk about uh, which victims they've attacked and, and so forth, or it can be done over Rocket Chat or Jabber or some other uh, you know, chat forum. Um, and then there's also active recruitment process. So up until now, like most of these criteria, uh, CLOP has met them, right? So uh, we would consider them a RAS. But one thing that we haven't noticed with CLOP is an active recruitment process. So they don't seem to be actively on the criminal forums um, looking for operators to come in and operate as affiliates. That's one thing we would expect to see with, a, with a, a proper RAS. And also, along with that, you would expect to see affiliate churn because most RAS operations um, really mandate that their affiliates uh, complete a certain number of attacks each week, each month, or are generating revenue at all times, which means certain ransomware actors fall out of the program, come into the program, et cetera. And we just haven't seen that with Gold Tahoe. So this is the timeline uh, of the, some of the recent uh, zero days and uh, in day attacks. Uh, so uh, the first one was a Celian, the FDA, that was in 2020. That really began uh, CLOP's notoriety with regards to exploiting, you know, scan and exploit style attacks. And then we had the serve you exploitation, the go anywhere MFT exploitation, and a few other ones bundled up there at the beginning of this year. Um, so the first one, a Celian, that was a zero day. But the serve you exploitation uh, wasn't. It was an end day uh, vulnerability that had been exploited in early July by a Chinese threat group and some other threat groups. Uh, so they picked up on it several months after it had been out there. Um, the same with Go, uh, Go Anywhere. Uh, this was one that was uh, uh, a zero day. Paper cut was not. It was an end day. It was exploited by other threat groups. Um, and then the move at transfer, the big one uh, that we're talking about, was also a zero day. So you can see here, this is the, uh, the, the number of victims that are posted on their uh, name and shame site. And you can see each one of these red lines is, is where uh, one of these attacks happened. And you can see a surge in victims published on each one of these that correlates uh, with, with each one of those vulnerabilities. You can see the biggest surge here at the end. That was Move It. Uh, the, the second largest surge back there was the Go Anywhere and paper cut vulnerabilities, et cetera. And you can see it sort of work cyclically um, as they're able to exploit um, each one of these vulnerabilities. So one way to explain that cyclical nature of that is how they attack. So the preparation phase is when they will, uh, uh, so the preparation phase is when they will identify victims. Um, they will uh, procure a, uh, a zero day or an end day vulnerability and they'll begin to scan the internet and identify a list of victims. Uh, exploitation is when they actually go in and attack the system um, and, and exfiltrate the data. And then there's a triage phase where they will identify who the victims are, 
uh, what kind of data is, is necessary to be published, and, uh, and then finally the long tail of extortion where they're actually going to individual um, victims and trying to figure out um, what they're willing to pay. So an anatomy of an attack, um, Gold Tahoe has different styles. Um, so when, the, when Gold Tahoe is um, executing their own attacks, um, which is in most cases, they will, um, you know, if they're, if they're exploiting a public vulnerability, um, they'll, they'll frequently not move laterally into the network and deploy ransomware because they'll, they'll build primitives on top of the vulnerability, the exploit that they build, and they'll use that primitive to then extract files um, from the, the appliance that actually has the sensitive data on it already, um, and they don't need to, to deploy additional malware. But in cases where they do a more traditional intrusion, they may see uh, some of their bespoke malware, like Git2 or Gracewire um, or SDB, SDBot or Cobalt Strike, and those will be used for lateral movement and eventually ransomware deployment, along with data exfiltration. So going back to if, if this group is a RAS, um, do they have affiliates? We have seen one affiliate, Gold Niagara, also known as Fen7. So this is a group that we observed in March of this year, uh, which was deploying CLOP ransomware as a terminal payload in attacks. And then several weeks later, Microsoft published an additional independent observation where they saw this threat group also deploying uh, CLOP ransomware. So they may not be uh, a group that uses a lot of affiliates, um, like many ransomware as a service operators, uh, but they do have trusted groups that they will use to perpetrate their attacks. So certainly there's some recommendations on how to prevent and mitigate this sort of thing from happening. Um, regular proactive external attack surface monitoring is really important, making sure that you understand where the devices are on, your, on the public internet. Uh, that could have this sensitive data, uh, an aggressive patch management schedule, uh, logging from the appliances and logging that goes to a SIM or an MDR platform where it can be actioned by the security analyst. And then finally, a data lifecycle management system. So uh, making sure that if you do have a file transfer application out there, that the data on there isn't data that's been around for years, maybe restricted to a few months. So that way, if there is a breach, you know, it, it, you're not losing years and years worth of data. And with that, I'm done. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, really interesting, interesting presentation. What's the significance of this group compared to others? The sophistication is, is really quite something. Yeah, so they're, they're definitely a competent and sophisticated group. Um, not a lot of groups are able to sort of curate these zero-day vulnerabilities and then use them to such great effect. Um, we don't see that very frequently. And also their, their actual normal traditional intrusions, even though they're not necessarily sophisticated. They're very competently executed um, and very effective. Amazing. Well, good to know. <laughs> definitely good yeah. to know. And yes, we definitely learned there. So hopefully we'll be on full alert this time around. But thank you very much, Keith. Next up.